final talk this morning is by Ken Miller from Columbia University, and he will speak about the regime of sensory cortical computation, loose EI balance, and normalization. Thanks. So I'm going to tell you about work that uh, has been done by, particularly by these people. Um, Dan Rubin, who was a grad student with me, who's now a neurology fellow of some sort at Harvard, and Yasha Madian, who was a postdoc with me and is now on the faculty at Oregon. Um, just all of these, I, you can't ask for, work is easy when you have wonderful people who do it. Um, and also, uh, I may mention some work we've done on how this circuit explains the stimulus-driven uh, suppression of variability, and that's been done by all of us, including Guillaume Henneken and Matteli Engel at Cambridge. So um, there's really, uh, I'm going to be addressing two issues today that are interlinked. One is how are excitation and inhibition, and inhibition, that's a typo, um, <laughs> balanced to keep the network stable without firing rate saturation? Um, and I'll explain why I think there's not firing rate saturation playing a role in the stability in a minute. <clears throat> and the other is how does cortex modulate response gain? And Oh, this was actually, oh well. Um, and that, uh, there's a lot of evidence, at least in layer four, that selectivity, you're tuning for the, the properties of the stimulus, orientation, direction, spatial frequency, and vision, are largely determined by the feed-forward inputs, uh, uh, these different groups, and here in S1, the same thing. Um, but that the cortical circuit is modulating the response gain through things like surround suppression, normalization, attention, so how does that happen? And the answer I'm going to propose is that the recurrent dynamics yields inhibitory stabilization by what I call a loose EI balancing, and I'll tell you what that means. And that, th that balancing uh, yields the observed nonlinear patterns of cortical gain modulation and normalization. Okay, so, um, so let's begin with uh, what, what do I mean by, uh, what, are, what are the examples of how cortical gain modulation works? Um, so the classic example uh, is shown here from J John Reynolds, lab, um, and this is a, a neuron in V4 that uh, you put a face in its uh, receptive field, it gives you a nice big response. You put a house in its receptive field, it gives you a much smaller response. You put both in the receptive field at the same time, and it gives you an intermediate response, something more like the average than the sum of the two responses. So that's a very sublinear summation. And then it goes on to say if you attend to one or the other, your response moves toward that. But I want to focus on this initial part. Uh, where you're getting a sublinear summation, more like the average than the sum of the two individual responses. Um, but, and this is seen uh, in many other phenomena, uh, and it's even been shown to happen. Uh, you don't know where this is happening. It might be already in the inputs to the piece of cortex you're recording from, but uh, it's been shown to happen in a particular piece of cortex, namely V1, by uh, Nassi and Reynolds, uh, who added an optogenetic and a visual stimulus in monkey V1 which, so the two stimuli, the optogenetics shouldn't change what's coming up from below. Uh, so you, the input should add linearly, but you still see the sublinear summation. Now I should add that um, Mark Histed and John Monsell have done the same experiment in mouse, and they seem to find linear summation. Um, and we have a possible explanation of that within the framework of this theory that I can tell you about at the end. But so it's maybe some exceptions, but mostly you see the sublinear summation. Um, <clears throat> And so now to, to talk about how this depends on the, the uh, input drive, I just have to make sure everybody's on the same page and knows what the contrast of a visual stimulus is, just the light-dark difference relative to the mean. And what it really represents to us is the strength of the feedforward input. The higher the contrast of a stimulus, the higher the firing rate of the LDN inputs to V1. Uh, so we'll use contrast to mean strength of feedforward input. Um, and so <clears throat> although moderately strong stimuli add sublinearly, low contrast stimuli add linearly, or maybe even superlinearly. This is shown from Ken Britton in a study of MT cells. We put two different motion stimuli in the receptive field of the, <coughs> of the MT cell, and when they were both high contrast, the, this is the sum of the two responses to the individual stimuli, and this is the actual response when both were shown together. So you can see when, uh, when they're both high contrast, you've got a sublinear summation, less than the sum of the two individually. But when they were what they called mixed contrast, meaning either one was of low contrast or both were of low contrast, you got a much more linear summation. And what they didn't tease out was when they were both very low, whether it might be superlinear, uh, which I'm going to tell you why I might think it is. Uh, and then they, they plotted the ISO uh, response contours, and they changed from, and I may get these, I always get these backwards, but uh, concave to convex, or is it vice versa? 
Anyway, they change <laughs> from one to the opposite. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and in our model, our model is going to look just like this. Um, and on our model, it's going from sublinear here to superlinear over here. But it doesn't prove that the MT is going all the way to superlinear here at low contrast. OK, so um, and this is also seen in other areas. It's seen in uh, MST, where you add vestibular and visual inputs. You get the sublinear summation for strong, but linear for weak inputs. Um, OK, and the winner take all, uh, the, this, this summation becomes winner take all for unequal strength stimuli. And that's illustrated here from uh, Matteo Carandini's lab where you see uh, here's the response of all the neurons plotted as a function of their preferred orientation in each little plot. And so here's showing horizontal stimuli. So if you show a 25% contrast horizontal stimulus, here's the cells that prefer horizontal re responding most strongly. Show 25% vertical, here's the cells that, that prefer ver vertical responding most strongly. Show both at the same time, you get the sublinear summation. But if one of them is stronger than the other, it's as if only the strong one was there. Um, and it turns out this uh, cross-orientation <coughs> suppression is not a good example because it, probably a lot of this is going on in the LGN inputs and not in V1. But the same thing is seen in monkey MT and is, is, is sort of ubiquitous enough that we suspect it might be a cortical property, though it hasn't really been proven that it's happening in a particular piece of cortex. Okay, so uh, another way that stimuli add or modulate each other's gain. So, so you can think of that as, you know, you show one stimulus, you've got a response, but you show another stimulus, it modulates the gain to the first response because you keep your same tuning. So that, that's, you can think of this as a gain modulation. How are things adding? And the idea is that when they're moderately strong, they tend to suppress each other. So they tend to sublinearly add. But when they're weak, then they tend to ignore each other, linearly add, or maybe even, as I'll show you now, facilitate. <coughs> So what's surround suppression? This, now, instead of adding two stimuli in the receptive field, we're going to add in the receptive field and outside the receptive field. Um, and so uh, this is from David Furster's lab. Uh, and the, the grading is drifting. And this is showing the spike rate over one cycle of the grading. This is a simple cell, so it fires on half the cycle. <clears throat> and here's, here's the blank stimulus. And now you go from 2 degrees to 20 degrees. This is not to scale. And the, the response is greatly suppressed. And that suppression depends on the center and the surround having matched orientations. Um, this surround suppression is seen at least across almost every visual, every visual area that's been studied, uh, and probably in other sensory areas as well. We don't know. And where it has been studied, when you make the center stimulus low contrast, then the surround either facilitates or more weakly suppresses uh, rather than uh, suppressing uh, strongly. So that's another example of. You know, weak stimuli tend to facilitate or ignore each other. Strong stimuli uh, suppress each other. Um, and so just to show you this, um, uh, I'll just show you one example uh, from uh, Matteo Carandini's lab. And what he did was he, uh, he recorded from a cell in monocular mouse V1, and he activated colossal fibers from the other side. So he was activating cells that were lateral in V1 over in the binocular region, lateral to the cell in the monocular region they were recording from. And so in this way, they could be pretty sure they were linearly adding inputs. You have one visual input. You have one lateral input that's activated optogenetically. And what they saw was that, so this is the contrast of the visual stimulus that's activating the center. And this is different levels of the light stimulus that's activating the surround. And you see when the center stimulus is weak, the surround enhances the response. But when the center stimulus is strong, the surround suppresses the response. Um, and another example of the same thing, um, if you make a size tuning curve, so you make a single contrast, that was showing have, having center and surround of different strengths. But now you have a single contrast across center and surround, and you just change the size, and you map out a length tuning curve. And you say, where does that peak before you start surround suppressing? That's called the summation field size. And that summation field size is bigger at low contrast, it shrinks with contrast, shrinks with the strength of input drive, meaning for weak inputs, stimuli out here in the surround that are facilitating you, for strong inputs, they're suppressing you. So that's a very nonlinear effect. Um, and, and that's shown here where the uh, ratio at some of the <laughs> summation field size at some low contrast over some high contrast tends to be bigger than one. This is from Monkey from Bob Shapley's lab. Um, so you have two kinds of nonlinearities. One is a sublinear summation. But the other is that the nature of the summation changes with the strength of the input, which wouldn't happen in, in a linear system. OK, so those are the sorts of gain modulation phenomena that the model I'm going to tell you about will explain. Uh, so let me tell you about the model. 
uh, which we call the stabilized superlinear network. And, and just to prime you, you'll, whoops, well, so much for priming you. Um, <laughs> um, you're gonna, I'm gonna show you that there's two regimes and a weakly coupled and a strongly coupled regime. And in the strongly coupled regime, you have a loosely balance, loose balance of excitation inhibition. And I'm gonna contrast that with tight balance. Okay, so where we, what's the superlinear in the superlinear stabilized network? It's that the individual neurons have a superlinear <coughs> input-output function. So what's shown here is from Nick Preby and David Furster, they measured the membrane potential in 30 millisecond bins and they looked at the firing rate in the same bins. I think they average over like five bins. So you get you know, one spike, zero spikes, one spike, two spikes, three spikes in five 30 millisecond bins give you these different firing rates. And the actual data is very noisy as shown by these gray dots. But that's because you have for, you know, you can imagine for a given fixed rate, you have some Poisson variability in the, how many spikes you get. Um, but if you average in voltage bins to try to get at what's the mean rate for each voltage, it's, very, it's the blue dots which are very well fit by this power law which is a power of, in this case, about 2.8. Um, and in general, different cells, they find it's between two and five. So it's an expansive nonlinearity, a power greater than one. <clears throat> Why do you get this? Uh, you can show very generally that um, when, you're, when your mean input is subthreshold or perithreshold, so that you're not, you're not integrating up towards a mean that's way above threshold, that would make you fire like a clock. You'd, you'd be integrating up, you'd hit, you'd fire like a clock. But instead, you're firing, the fluctuations are driving you to spike. That makes you fire in a more Poisson way, which is how cortex fires. So we think cortex, for various reasons, is firing on the fluctuations, not on the mean. When you are firing on the fluctuations, you get this power law input-output function. The reason is basically because the, the, the fluctuations have some bell-shaped curve, and as you move the mean over, the portion of that curve that's above threshold is growing superlinearly, and that's basically your firing rate. Um, now, uh, a couple things to notice about this. One is, this is across the full range, this is an anesthetized cat V1, this is across the full range of visual stimuli you can show this cell, including the most optimal cell that drives it as hard as you possibly can. And so, of course, we know eventually the cell has to saturate, but you don't see that in the normal dynamic range. So we're gonna just assume that there's no saturation in order to understand how the circuit keeps itself stable here without using saturation to stabilize itself. <clears throat> um, and, right, so what does this do for you? Uh, well, actually, before I do that, let me just say, um, uh, that what I'm really gonna assume is that from the input the, you know, the weights, the recurrent input, the weights times the rates, plus the feed forward inputs, their rates, from the input to the firing rate is a, is a superlinear function. Now what I'm showing you here is from the membrane potential of the firing rate. From the input to the membrane potential might be sublinear if you have synaptic depression or spike rate adaptation, might be superlinear if you have synaptic facilitation or dendritic integration that's, that's nonlinear. What I have to assume is that whatever this input to membrane potential mapping is, it's not so sublinear that it turns this around and makes it sublinear. So long as the net stays superlinear, we're gonna be okay. All right, and then the last thing, so what does this do for you? It means that your gain, how much does your firing rate change for a change in your input is, is it's just the slope of this curve and that is monotonically growing as the, as the cell and the network get more activated. So uh, what does that do for you? Well, that means you have increasing effective synaptic strengths in your network. What do I mean by an effective synaptic strength? Basically, when I jiggle the presynaptic rate, how much does the postsynaptic rate jiggle in response? That's the product of two terms. Uh, it's the product of the synaptic strength, how much, how much input do I inject, and the gain, how much does my rate jiggle in response to that input? Uh, another way to think of it is if I linearize about a fixed point, this product is what I get from my effective weights in the linearized system. So, uh, so as the gain goes up, my cells are more and more sensitive to their input, and so I effectively have stronger and stronger coupling. And so what does this do for you? Well, uh, imagine now I have a network of excitatory cells in red, inhibitory cells in blue. They have some coupling to each other. Each one's receiving some feed-forward input. Um, and first, let's consider very weak activation. So the gain is going to zero. So if I'm very weakly activated, then I have very weak effective synaptic strength. And the key thing, is that if I assume that the network does not have a, that as the feed forward input goes to zero, the network activity goes to zero, it doesn't have a self-maintained high state, then feed forward 
activation just requires one of these weak synapses. But recurrent activation requires a feed-forward synapse to activate the cortical cell to activate the recurrent weak synapse. So the recurrence comes in at two or more weak synapses. And so if the, gain, if the synapses are weak enough, if the gain is small enough, just like x squared is much less than x if x is small enough, um, the, uh, the recurrence becomes very weak compared to the feed-forward input. And so you get into a weakly coupled or almost uncoupled uh, <laughs> regime. Uh, and therefore, when I show two stimuli, their feed-forward inputs just add their network doesn't change that very much. And then I put it through a superlinear input-output function. And so I should get more than the sum of the responses of the two stimuli by themselves. Uh, responses should add superlinearly. But now, what if I go to a stronger activation regime? Well, so the effective strengths are getting stronger and stronger the more I activate. And so the recurrent contribution grows relative to the feed-forward and becomes dominant. And in particular, the EDE connections become effectively strong enough that the network, the EDE network would be become potentially unstable by itself. Basically, if the, if the E cells fluctuated up by themselves, they, the, the recurrence that would recruit, they would be so sensitive to it that they would keep going up. So you have a potential instability, uh, but you can show that if you have sufficiently strong feedback inhibition and, and the actual condition for a two population model, just E and I without more cells, is that the, um, the product of the two negative feedback terms is bigger than the product of the two positive feedback terms. And in addition, if the inhibitory time constant is sufficiently small relative to the excitatory time constant, then you can prove the network will go to a stable fixed point uh, and it won't run away. Um, and in practice, you find even in, in big networks, if you sort of make the equivalent of these conditions true, the network stays, typically stays stable. So, uh, but how does it stabilize? So that, that tells you that you will stabilize. What does it have to do to stabilize? And what we can show <laughs> is that in order to stabilize, the network has to balance. The recurrence has to largely cancel the feed-forward input, meaning the E and the I are balancing. They're canceling each other, leaving a residual that grows sublinearly as a function of the net feed-forward input. So if the feed-forward input is growing, you know, it, here's the growth of the feed-forward input, the net input after the cancellation maybe is growing as the square root of that or the cube root of that, so much, much more slowly. So you're losing most of the feed-forward input that you add as you add more stimuli. And so what that means is that uh, the network responses, and this I can maybe talk more about offline, but basically it, it grows as, as the one over n power, but then it gets raised to the n, so you might think it comes out linear, but for many purposes, it comes out sublinear. Um, and so you end up basically canceling most, when you add a second stimulus, you, add, you end up canceling most of this feed-forward input and you end up getting sublinear summation. So the balancing is giving you the sublinear summation, basically. Um, so uh, let's see how that works. <clears throat> so here's our firing e equation, so R is the uh, vector of all of the firing rates of all of our neurons. And what we're saying is in the steady state, that firing rate is the input raised to the n, where the input is the weight matrix times the rates, that, that's the vector of, of recurrent inputs, plus the feed-forward inputs, which I'm going to call g, which is a shape. Think of the g's as being order one. So this one receives one, this one receives a half, this one receives two. And then c, for contrast, which is how I'm going to scale up the input by changing the scalar while keeping the G's shape the same. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> and then to give it dynamics, we just make it approach its steady state with first order dynamics. Um, so for weak input, this is what I showed you, what I said to you before, that if, if, if C is very, very small, we can expand this as CG plus W times R, which is CG plus W times R. And so you end up with just a feed forward input, what, what you get from the feed forward input alone and everything involving W, everything involving recurrence, comes in at higher order in C. So if C is small enough, this becomes negatively small and you're feed forward dominated. So, and here's what that looks like. So very, for very small C, um, here's my feed forward input going up. Um, and here's my total recurrent input. It stays smaller than my feed forward input. And then my excitatory response, I think I'm using N equals two here, is just the square of the sum of these two. And so here's the super linear growth of the response. But now, that's, that's this little box here. But as I increase the strength of C and I get into the strongly coupled regime, something very interesting happens. The recurrent, here's the feed forward input growing. The recurrent input turns around, becomes negative, and grows at almost the same rate as the feed forward input. So you're canceling most of the feed forward input, and the net is growing like this. 
which is, it is growing because when you square it, you see the growth of the firing rate, which is the square of this dashed line. Uh, but you're, you're growing very sublinearly. It turns out this response versus C, there's two regimes. One grows sublinear like this, one will eventually grow linearly. So I'm showing you the sublinear regime. But when you add two different stimuli, two different shapes of stimuli, they typically add sublinearly. Um, so, but the, the main thing I want you to take home here is to see how without, there's no fine tuning. This is just, you put it in that regime where it's gonna be stable, where I told you we can guarantee it'll be stable. This is what it has to do to stay stable. The dynamics make this happen. We don't tune anything. The recurrence just cancels the feed forward input, leaving a very slowly growing, sublinearly growing residual. Um, another thing, so actually let me, uh, let me start with the left. Um, so as we increase the input strength, and this happens to be for a ring architecture, but you see the same thing for any architecture. Uh, it's very generic to this model with the power law and put-output functions. Uh, here's the total feed forward input uh, that the neurons receive uh, to the excitatory neurons in red or to the inhibitory neurons in blue. And here's the total recurrent input that they receive to the excitatory or the inhibitory neurons. And so you see for very weak input, then as advertised, you're receiving much more, most of your input is feed forward. Your very small amount is recurrent. But at about the point where the excitatory network goes unstable, as it turns out, you get a crossing and then the recurrent input comes to dominate after that. Uh, and furthermore, if you look just at the recurrent input and say, uh, what percentage of it ex is excitatory? Look at the excitatory input over the excitatory plus inhibitory input. That is monotonically decreasing as you drive the network harder and harder. Basically, both inhibition and excitation sub sum sublinearly. They both, none, it isn't the one of them, the inhibition su summing superlinearly to make excitation sub sub sum sublinearly. They both sum sublinearly. But the inhibition has to go faster than the excitation to keep things stable. And that's what you're seeing here. The, inhibition, the inhibitory firing rates are going faster. Yeah, Peter. Sorry, the, um, both excitatory and inhibitory neurons get about the same input? Uh, in this, here they do, yeah, but it doesn't depend on that. If you apply input only to excitatory neurons, you get the same result? Yeah, except that um, you'll get roughly the same results, yes, but the, um, the, the, the contrast response curve or the input strength response curve will be linear in that case. It won't turn over. It won't saturate. But for many purposes, you'll still get sublinear summation. Okay. Yeah. What was the assumption of the anti curve for I cells? So here, I'm assuming that everybody is biophysically identical, E and I. They all have exactly the same power law. That, that I'm doing that basically to say you get all these effects without, without making the uh, inhibition have some special biophysical properties. Uh, but if, if you change them, you won't, won't fundamentally change this story because the basic story is about going unstable and what it takes to stabilize. Well, it may change if you assume inhibition is faster, much, or slower. Than, than well, then you can lose stability. Yeah, you can lose stability in that case, sure. Okay, and this should be compared with, uh, from Dan Feldman's lab where they optogenetically excited uh, some E cells and recorded the charge received by the non optogenetically excited cells. And the harder they drove things optogenetically, the more this ratio went down. And Hilal Adesnik has recently shown exactly the same thing in mouse V1, where this decreases both with contrast and with stimulus size, which the model also predicts. Um, boy, I'm not going to get to tell you half of what I wanted to, but um, let me just compare this to the tightly balanced network. So, um, we can show that this transition, there's a dimensionless parameter, which we call alpha, which is basically the typical st strength of recurrent weights times the typical strength of feed forward weights raised to the n minus one power. This transition occurs when this parameter is order one. Um, so, and, and you can write an expansion for the firing rate in the strongly coupled regime, which is, here's the term that cancels the feed forward input. You apply W to this, you get negative the feed forward input. So this term cancels the feed forward input, and the residual goes as c to the 1 over n. It grows sublinearly with the feed forward input. And it, 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 it actually is of this form. You have c over typical weight size. This gives you the units of rate. And then here's, this is order 1. j is just the normalized w, um, and g is the normalized feed forward input with the c taken out. And the next order term is order alpha to the negative 1 over n. Um, but where this transition happens when alpha is order 1, meaning this term is the same order of magnitude as this term. They're both comparable to each other. And that's what we're going to mean by loose balance, that what's left over after the cancellation is comparable in size to the things that cancel. Um, uh, and note that this first term, 
is a linear function of the feedforward input. It has to be because it's canceling the feedforward input. It has to be linear in the feedforward input to cancel it. Um, the second term gives you the net input after cancellation. So this is a new, loose balance. Um, and it, the fact that it's a loose balance is what allows you to have nonlinear response properties. If it was a tight balance, meaning that if this term was tiny compared to this term, so what's left over is tiny compared to the things that cancel, then that means that, that this is basically your firing rate. And this is linear in the input. And this is negligible. And so your firing rate is linear in the input. You can't get nonlinear responses. So it's only by loosely balancing that you get, whoops, that you get this nonlinear uh, term. Um, right, that you get this nonlinear term that allows you to have nonlinear response properties. So let's compare that to tight balance, which is when alpha goes to infinity. And this is the balance network solution of Van Vrievik and Sambolinsky and Renard studied. Uh, and what they showed was that when the inputs were really big, they would cancel each other to leave something really small, something negatively small. They showed you get tight balance. And it, it's a seminal study. I don't mean to say it's not, but I want to say that it's not the right regime for cortex. Uh, it's seminal because it showed us that the dynamics could do the balancing without any fine tuning, among other reasons. Um, but so what they assumed was all of these uh, parameters were of order square root of k, where k was some big number, the number of excitatory inputs received by an excitatory cell. Um, and so uh, if each of these is square root of k, then this, it goes as k to, alpha goes as k to the n over 2, and so this term is precisely 1 over square root of k, so this is, which is what they found for their second order term. And this is, k was big, so this was negligibly small compared to this. They had tight balance, but they had only linear response. So this is actually the exact same expansion that you get for the balance network. The difference is we're already getting the balancing when alpha is order one, not when alpha is going to infinity. And that's what's giving us all the nonlinear behavior that looks like cortex. Um, uh, so to summarize, well, let me, I think you've got this, so let me just try to uh, push through a little bit. Um, is the external input, what regime is cortex really in? Is the external input greater than the net input after cancellation, which would be tight balance, or is it comparable? Uh, well, when cortex is silenced to reveal the thalamic input, the LGN-induced voltage response is typically a third to a half of the net input when cortex was intact. It's not 10 or 100 times bigger, which is what tight balance would predict, that you take these big things and cancel to make a small net. Similarly, if you look at the excitatory conductance, uh, the conductance after you silence cortex is about 30 to 40 percent of the net conduct excitatory conductance with cortex intact. So it's the external input and the net are comparable. Um, and actually, that doesn't contradict tight balance, as I think about it. So I think I'm in a mistake there. But at any rate, the important thing is that when you look at the total excitatory input, um, that uh, the peak excitatory conductance with cortex intact is on the order of 60 to 150 picoamps, input resistance on the order of 150 to 200 megaohms. That means that the excitatory conductance is enough to depolarize you by 9 to 30 millivolts, which is completely comparable to the 20 millivolt distance to threshold, whereas tight balance means you've got to be orders of magnitude bigger than the distance to threshold. So all of the data says we're in a loosely balanced regime. The input is comparable to threshold. The external input is comparable to the net input. Um, and I was going to do uh, some calculations of the mean and variance, but I'm not going to do that because I'm out of time. Sorry, Ken, is, is the last point when you silence the cortex or when you don't silence the cortex? OK, let me go back if I can. Um, right, so this is without silencing. This is the total excitatory conductance down here. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to obviously skip this, and I'm going to give you my conclusion slides. Um, so what does the SSN explain? Uh, it turns out, given simple models of connectivity, that the connectivity falls off a distance of retinotopic space or in feature space. It explains sublinear summation that becomes linear or superlinear as the stimulus weakens. One thing I didn't say is that I don't know where spontaneous is. So for very, very weak, for almost zero input, I have superlinear. Stronger, it becomes sublinear. Maybe spontaneous is around the transition, and so we can only get down to linear. Or maybe cortex can get all the way to, to superlinear. We don't know. But at least it's going in the right direction, su sublinear to linear, as, as things get weaker. Um, and it becomes winner take all for unequal strength stimuli. We get all the surround suppression phenomena, facilitation for a weak center, uh, summation field size expands as the stimulus weakens, other phenomena. Um, the same model explains the suppression of the shared component of variability with increasing stimulus strength. Basically, once you're in the strongly coupled regime, as you drive the network st more strongly, it becomes more strongly inhibition stabilized, meaning if you linearize about the fixed point, 
your, the real parts of your leading eigenvalues are being pushed more negative. That means those leading modes are fluctuating less. And if your connectivity has some structure, space smooth structure, then those leading modes have some smooth structure, so they represent correlated activity, and their fluctuations are getting suppressed by the increasingly strong stabilization. Um, and various experimental tests in our 2015 paper, uh, we predicted that there were standing waves with a preferred frequency that shrinks, or a period that shrinks with increasing contrast, and found that to be true in ferret V1. Um, we just published a paper. Whoop, keep doing that. Um, well, that tells me my 30 minutes are up. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, we just published a paper with uh, Chris Pack and Dave Liu that in MT, just as you have, uh, you know, the, the, you prefer a bigger stimulus in, in retinotopic space for, for weak stimuli than you do for strong stimuli, same should be true in feature space. If you can show many directions at once, you should prefer a wide set of directions at low contrast and a narrower set of directions at high contrast. The wide set should start suppressing you, and that's just what they saw. Um, and the shrinking EI ratio with increasing stimulus strength, as I showed you. And so the conclusion is that all of these things are the outcomes of stabilization by inhibitioning, inhibition or loose balancing of a recurrent network with a destabilizing or superlinear input-output function. And I'll stop there and thank the people who did the work. Thank you. Yeah, Eve. Uh, yeah, I, I have a, a, a small problem with the notion of balance excitation in the uh, When the cell is spiking most of the time, it's because there is a transient imbalance between excitation and inhibition. And in the regime that you're using, you're using ratings, uh, optimized ratings where excitation is out of phase with uh, inhibition in simple cells, for instance. Uh, so how much can we say from the type of regime that you're uh, dealing with as a prediction of what happens with natural scenes and natural images? OK, so you're, everything I've shown you has been about steady state responses, not about transient responses. And um, I think you're basically asking about what happens with, with dynamic transient responses. And, I have to say, I don't know the answer. That's, that's something we need to study, sort of on what time scale do you do the balancing, what happens, you know. So, yeah, we need to study that, but I don't have any good answers. Yeah, partly. Um, so I'm trying to like, get a, a sort of a functional understanding of what this whole thing might mean. I mean, there's a lot of phenomena, and they go in the right direction. Let's, let's just accept that you've got the right model for V1 or, or for cortex, let's say, the canonical EI balancing circuit. So you know we have we have concepts lying around like uh, divisive normalization helps to take out multiplicative factors in signals that are nuisance factors. You know the kind of Schwartz and Simoncelli idea. This is a, a more complicated normalization circuit. <laughs> I mean I can't I can't in my head see why you would want to do all of these things. Okay, I, I have actually have a good answer for that. Yasher has a good answer for that. So Yasher has figured out uh, at Oregon. Um, I don't have anything to do with it. That. Um, he takes the, the Schwartz and, and Simoncelli model, which is, it's a model of natural scenes, it's called a Gaussian scale mixture. And so you basically, if I remember right, you assume that there's a, a positive scale multiplying a Gaussian distribution that explains the distribution in natural scenes, and then you're trying to infer, you're trying to get rid of the scale and infer the underlying uh, variable independent of scale, so independent of variations in contrast. And what Yasher, Yasher has done is added noise to that model. And when he adds noise, he gets these transitions. So in other words, the, that model predicts the normalizing, the strongly coupled regime behavior. Once he adds noise, he gets both regimes uh, as, as he makes the, the, the scaling factor weak. So the purpose of the circuit is to do that type of function, but in, region, in, in regimes of high and low noise? Is that how you would say what you just, is that that, what that, that would be, yeah. I mean, at least Yasher has got a nice theory that matches this, which is, which is exactly what you just said. Now, is that why? I don't know, but it's one nice story about why. Yeah? What happens when the uh, currents become more long range and you don't have this sort of close slope right on top of it? Wait, so when, when the recurrence becomes more long range? Yeah. How does it break? I mean, you said that this works when, when things are quite rough on top of it. Well, no, just that just the things fall off. I get the surround suppression in retinotopic space. I mean, the circuit knows about retinotopic space because things fall off with retinotopic distance. If, if things didn't fall off with retinotopic distance, it wouldn't know anything about retinotopic space. 
um, except maybe from the feedforward input. Um, but the, the basic normalizing properties and the transition between regimes is going to happen regardless of that. We may not get the same surround suppression phenomena. Yeah. Uh, small question about the difference uh, between the tight balance and the loose balance. Uh, in the tight balance, one of the nice properties that uh, it can track an input very fast with time scales that is much uh, smaller than the intrinsic time scale of neurons. Is there something uh, similar in the loose balance? Uh, kind yeah, of? It, it doesn't go. I mean, basically, in the tight balance, you're your, uh, your eigenvalues are going to negative infinity, and so you're, you're becoming infinitely fast. Um, here, the eigenvalues are negative, so you're faster than the membrane time constant or comparable to the membrane time constant, but you're not going to zero. Um, and so, for example, uh, I don't know if, if uh, Massimo is still around, but in, uh, there he is, yeah. So Massimo showed that when you, when you silence thalamus, V1 activity decays in about 10 milliseconds, about a, a something like a, a cellular time or synaptic time constant, the model does the same thing. It, it has very fast response. And actually, that's in a paper we just submitted with Guillaume and Mate about the suppression of variability. We show that there, there's a couple of other models of suppression of variability. One is a stimulus suppresses chaos. Another is that you have, you're wandering between multiple fixed points, and the stimulus pins you to one of them. And we showed that in both of those, the the onset of the stimulus, the, the, the suppression of variability after the onset and the recovery of variability after the offset is much slower than the cellular time constant, whereas in our case, it's roughly comparable. Well, or two or three times, it, but it, it's in the same order of magnitude. That's and and that seems to match the data, that, that the, the suppression is fast. And, and so this gives you the fast suppression what and kind of recovery. An architecture is it? Uh, for example, a ring architecture, but that's, that's not really important. Please join me in thanking you. <laughs>